Good evening and welcome to the March 9th, 2022 School Committee meeting. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Our first item of business is a department report update from the robotics team and Ms. Julie Kim, welcome. Well, thank you for having us. It's our pleasure to be here tonight. Um, myself and Mrs. Marlene King, we are the co-advisors for the Wilmington Wired Wildcats. It is a tongue twister. We are a high school-based robotics team affiliated with FIRST. FIRST is a global robotics community which actually helps to promote STEM education for young people. FIRST stands for For Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. At this point, I'm gonna have our team members, we don't have everybody present, but we do have a good showing of students who are gonna come and actually talk to you about who they are, what they've learned, and any challenges that they've had to overcome through the robotics competition. Technical issue, so you know what's happening. <laughs> Don't worry, we're not Sorry. distracted Let at all. We're high school know. teachers, we can teach them anything. In right. order, so we're sitting here, so I can't see the screen behind me. So, what they've done is they've provided a screen for those of us sitting right here, so we can see the same PowerPoint, which is often confusing to people because they wonder what we're looking at. But we're actually looking at your presentation, it's right in front of us. So, it wasn't working, and so I didn't want to turn my head and not look at what was happening in front of me. So, all right, all right, so this is the team. Hello, my name is Victor, I'm a senior. I'm the project manager and the notebook lead. The, t the main challenge I've encountered through when I was in this team is that not only I have two roles to manage, but I have to summarize each meeting as the month progresses and also have to manage the task as the, each, each meeting goes on. This is a notebook we brought to the competition it has a summary of each meeting the t about the team, the competition, and the engineering pr design progress. You can pass it around. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Eleanor. I'm a freshman and the strategy lead. Uh, something difficult for me personally was adapting to the uh, different types of meat because because of COVID this year, there were two types, a remote meet, which was our first one, and then for us a week after an in-person meet. And the game changes in small ways between the two. So I had to adapt for a remote meet and then uh, we had to practice and change the strategy and the documents for the in-person meet right afterwards. Uh, this is my third year doing robotics and I actually came up from the middle school team like a lot of our members. Uh, I'm gonna, the game principle, I guess, is to move pieces of freight from one end of the field to the other. Uh, there were three types, and our general strategy was to put them on the top level, which was worth the most amount of points. Another key aspect of the game was uh, these ducks. They're on a carousel, which is a plate with an axle in the middle, and we spin them off for extra points. I have, with me the flyers that we handed out to the teams at the meet so that they could see what we could do. Uh, okay, yeah, if we want to pass it on, they'll probably be extras. And also I have the scoring form for the in-person matches, which details pretty much exactly the different ways that you can score uh, and is how we scored our remote matches and was part of our scouting for the in-person. You can also look at those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, we're the mechanical team. My name is Sarthak uh, and I'm a 10th grader. My name is Cam and I'm a 9th grader. My name is Monty and I'm a 10th grader. My name is Dan and I'm a 10th grader. And our biggest uh, challenge as a team was coming up with a claw, which, which took uh, multiple hours. Uh, 
multiple iterations to come up with to grab the freight and put it on the highest level. So our claw has been through multiple iterations as we continued to find flaws that kept coming up. This is one of our iterations that, if you can see, has been through a lot. We tried to fix it manually, but nothing was working. So we decided to redesign and remodel with our mechanical team and our CAD team, and we came up with our latest iteration. It looks much different, and the density of the 3D printed part is much more thick on the out outside layers of the shell and around our servo motors, which are these black ones above the gears, are held in place by 3D printed platforms that are our newest addition. Now, this arm stands upon a chassis, which is essentially just the base, and it has four mechanism wheels attached to it, and that means that we can move in all directions. Um, we also have chains within it, which just help it to move better, and also we have these wheels attached on the side, because they're like these boundaries within the game, and it just helps us to get over them easier. And here on the robot, we have this wheel that allows us to spin the carousel to gain points by getting this duck off the carousel to score points. Uh, hi, I'm Nicholas. I'm the software lead, and I'm a sophomore. Hi, I'm Babush, and I'm a freshman. Uh, one of our biggest challenges was um, through problems with the communication system on the robot. Uh, the robot communicates through two cell phones into what are called expansion hubs, which you can see right there and right there. Um, expansion hubs are sort of like the brain of the robot, and they direct the movement of the motors, and the phones communicate through a system called a private Wi-Fi network. Uh, the problem with that is that it leads to if one part of that system is disconnected or not working, the entire robot will <laughs> shut down, essentially which can get annoying, so, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, another thing that we uh, did this year is we used a color sensor, which is uh, right here. And basically, we used uh, that in conjunction with the elapsed time variable to uh, smartly make our autonomous mode, which has multiple different outcomes and can change depending on uh, where the random variables. Uh, uh, we're the CAD team. My name is Rachel. I'm a junior, and this is my second year in robotics. Hi, my name is Leanne. I'm a junior, and this is my first year in robotics. My name is Audrey. I'm a junior, and this is my first year in robotics. My name is Kira. I'm a freshman, and this is also my first year in robotics. So CAD stands for Computer Aided Design, which essentially means that we take a 2D design and turn it into a 3D model, which we then um, make into an actual object using a 3D printer and as you can see on the robot we uh, designed and printed our uh, battery case and we designed and 3D printed our um, phone case. I'd say one of our biggest challenges for majority of the team is that due to the pandemic most of our previous uh, we had a gap year so most of our um, previous members graduated. So we basically had to start from scratch, which um, came with a big learning curve, but thankfully we overcame it. One of the other big challenges we faced was with the 3D printer. So due to lack of maintenance during COVID-19, when we got back to school in September, the 3D printers weren't working. And in addition, um, none of the CAD team members have ever used a 3D printer before. But after like a long process of trial and error, we were finally able to get the 3D printer working and working really well. So another thing we designed was the capstone, which this goes. Our robot places this on top of the shipping hub to score points. So this was our first model, which goes on it really well, but we had trouble picking it up. So we designed this different one, which is made out of spheres, because that's what our claw is good at picking up. And it also gets knocked over a lot during a match, so it's the same no matter which way it's on. And we made this prototype of it without the holes to practice printing spheres, since that was difficult to do. And then this was the final version, which goes like that. One of the other things we printed were little keychains for each of our members. Um, and so ducks featured prominently 
in our game, and so we named our robot Ducky, and we thought it was appropriate. So we actually have these for you to keep, so if you'd like to take one and pass it down. Um, at the competition itself, the CAD team doesn't really have much to do, because it's not like we can bring the printer with us. So we did a lot of scouting, like looking at what other robots could do, how they worked, um, and it was surprisingly easy. Uh, and I think that I can speak for all of us when I say we had a lot of fun with it. Hi, my name is Nikos, and I'm the community outreach and PR lead on the robotics team. I'm a junior, and this is my first year here. So we actually have a lot of people on our team, especially compared to other schools. And how we got a lot of people, we had we presented our club at the activities fair at the beginning of the year and we also got a lot of members through word of mouth that's how I ended up joining this year and I'm really glad that we were able to get more people through that method because I wouldn't have joined if I, I didn't hear about it from Leanne or <laughs> Shia <laughs> <laughs> and we also run an Instagram account where we share pictures and videos of the progress we make on our robot and I would think one of the biggest challenges we've had is trying to get more followers with that account. We've actually gained a lot, but we're still trying to get more to gain more exposure out there and get more outreach to the community. And another challenge is we're trying to find some engineers to help mentor our team. So if there are any engineers out there nearby, we're happy to have you with us. Oh yeah, you can DM us at wildcats underscore robotics. <laughs> Here are some pictures of our robot. And we also have some videos. The first one is of the robot um, getting ducks off the carousel, which is how we got a lot of points. And... <laughs> This is uh, us at the competition last month. We actually got second place, and in the video, they are controlling the robot, trying to carry the different freights to the um, hub there. And now we're going to have the mechanical team show you how the robot moves. Um, we use this phone to connect to with the phone that's on the robot um, to basically uh, connect with it and to control it with the ro uh, controllers. And you want it? So, and then we'll just do it right now. Awesome. Um, do you, are there more? I'm sorry. No, no, more? we're done. All right. Can we ask questions? The floor is yeah. open. Yes. I'm sure there are some questions or comments. Mr. Fennelly. I, I have a comment and a question. My comment is this is amazing. And I think you guys were here a couple of years ago before COVID, and I was equally impressed. But how long does something like this take to put together? How, like, how long have you guys been working on this? Probably a, a, an oversimplified question, I imagine. but. took us this year, uh, like, I'd say probably longer than it usually takes us, uh, which took us, like, around uh, four months, I think, uh, from, like, the beginning of the year, because it also took time for the uh, competition to actually come out mm -hmm. and all its rules. Uh, and we also needed to manage the team since, um, as one of the members have already said, we had a practically new team, and we had to come up with the management. And um, does anybody else have yeah. The game comes out in September uh, every year, and we actually, our first meeting was, I think, a week or two before it came out. And then immediately after, we started drafting plans, uh, and I, as the strategy lead, worked on the strategy. We met at the beginning, 
every Thursday and Friday until 4.30. As the competition came closer, we started meeting more frequently. And right now, since they're over, we meet every Thursday at, till 4.30. <laughs> so our claw was had multiple flaws you know it, it kept breaking at our most crucial parts that we were, we needed it to not um, so our printer at school was unfortunately not working at some periods so some other people had to step in and I myself printed a few key parts uh, with the CAD team's help of course and so we went through multiple iterations you know printing problems they come up and so we went through, I'd say, five models, and the one that I showed was one of them. Uh, and, you know, just mistakes happen. And so we just had to keep going, keep making, uh, you know, fixing it and making it better. Well, it's, ama it's amazing, so thank you. the school committee because it's amazing the creations that you create. I'm not a I'm of that generation or not I'm not a techie in any respect other than watching Star Trek. But, um, <laughs> it's it's it truly is amazing what is being done just within our, our school and the mentorship and the passion that is evident um, in your teams and, and, and you know I know that you guys are all broken down collectively um, in your different groups, but the collaboration and coming together to create something like this and, and to take second place, you know what I mean? That's a huge accomplishment, especially in a high school where this club is still relatively new. And and, and it's amazing the, the games that you've made, and I can I'll be honest with you, I, I, I'm a little lost in the vocabulary, but you know, I'll Google it app when I get home. Um, but I, I do have to say, I'm, I'm just so very proud of the, the time and investment and the problem solving piece that you've all had to um, undertake to, to create your final project. And um, I want to commend you. Other questions or comments? Uh, we're obviously going to continue doing this in future years. But right now, we're focusing instead on, uh, I forget the word, but uh, like onboarding. onboarding. That's it, yes, thank you. Uh, teaching members from different uh, parts of the team how to do things, like we're building push bots. I'm not an engineer person, but I'm learning how to do it. That's our goal. Awesome. Can I ask a quick question about the portfolio? Is that a requirement for the, oh, it is a requirement, for the competition? See. And about how long, I mean, obviously there are people doing different pieces of it, but how long does that process take? So it looks like your doc, I didn't get to read the whole thing, but you're documenting every single step of the process. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, personally, I did the majority of the work because I didn't have a lot of partners, unfortunately, <laughs> but that's fine. The way I usually do is that each meeting, I come in the beginning and do attendance and then after attendance, I find out what everyone planned to do. And at the end of the meeting, I summarize what had been accomplished and what's planned for next meeting. And then once I got all the meetings right before the competition, I edit, edit it, each of them. And at the, at the front of that notebook, if you view it, it has a full on summary of the entire of each meeting. And you organize the whole thing as well with all the tabs and the different, so that it's easy for the judges to get to what they need to get to? Yep. That's all. Very impressive. Thank you. Wow. Oh, I can, I can see that. I can see that. And then homework, I know. Well, anything else? Any other questions or comments? Comment. Yeah, go ahead. Just, uh, you guys are all amazing and a credit to Wilmington High School, and we are very, very proud of you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. thank you, and thank you very much. We appreciate your leadership. All right, Isabella and David, are you ready? Just about ready when they clear. The next item of business is our middle school student representatives. Give us a, an update. So 
Uh, Wilmington Middle School has been a very busy place recently. Uh, the Wilmington Middle School Literacy Magazine is working on their next edition title, Theme Capsule. This edition will include stories, poems, and artwork dedicated to the history. More specifically, students have been exploring the history of the Wilmington Middle School. Time Capsule will include stories and interviews from teachers who have been there from the beginning. Some started as students and are now teachers. On March 11th, guidance counselors will visit 8th graders at the middle school. They will review the program of studies with students and help them navigate course selections for their freshman year. It's hard to believe our middle school years are almost over. World, the World Culture Club just wrapped up their Lunar New Year celebration with a focus on Ch the Chinese culture. They will be celebrating April Fool's traditions around the world. Surveys will be going out to the Wilmington Middle School students to dedicate our next world adventure. Student Council partnered with GSA Club to help hang awareness signs. Students are committed to making Wilmington Middle School a safe space for all students. There will be a day of silence on April 8th to bring awareness. For Project thir uh, 351, did you know more than one in three children living in Massachusetts under the age of 13 live in low income or homeless situations? Wilmington's Project 351 Ambassador Allie Hall will be running our annual C Cradles to Crayons clothing drive from Tuesday, March 29th to Monday, April 4th. Through our generous donations, we are able to positively impact the lives of children in our state. Be our guest. Be our guest. <laughs> Wilmington Middle School Drama Club is proud to present their much anticipated production of Beauty and the Beast. From March 24th to 26th, the middle school auditorium will hop the globe over to France for a magical tale that will delight and inspire the audience. Tickets are available by calling 978-267-7225, or students may purchase them in the school beginning March 14th. If you have not gotten your tickets and you would like to see the show, act fast because half the tickets, over half the tickets have been sold. We hope to see you all there. Thank you. Is that the end? Oh, so if we need tickets, we have to call that number? Is that what we have to do? Okay. Right. And you're suggesting that we get our tickets ahead of time. And how many performances will there be? There's going to be three shows, okay. the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th. And that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Uh, I'm Thursday, guessing? Friday, Saturday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. All right. You hear that? Get your tickets very soon. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, as always, I'm for not your... Not a school committee walk-in policy? I know. Mm -hmm. We can't show our badges? <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to pass for that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We really love having you here, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Any questions? I'm sorry. Comments? I just passed right over that part. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you at Beauty and the Beast for sure. Are you in it? I'm on costumes, but I'm not in it. Okay. Well, you're, but you're a part of it. All right. Well, I'll see you there. All right. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you both. Good night. All right. Our next item of business is public comment. Mr. Ragsdale. Uh, we had no one sign up for public comment tonight, but is there anyone in the audience who would like to make a public comment? Seeing none, the committee also received two written public comments which were distributed to us before the meeting. Thank you. All right, item six, we have approval of items by consensus. Approval of minutes, February 16th, 2022. Is there a motion? Mr. Fennelly, seconded by Mr. Smaha. All in favor? That is, oh, and one abstention. I'm sorry, is that an abstention? Yes. yes. So Joe is an abstention, thank you. We have acceptance of the WEF Curriculum Grants Award don't have that right in front of me. There's a, quite a few. Sorry, I'm just getting it. Does anyone have it up? Yeah, do you want me to yes. re read them? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sure. So uh, WEF uh, is uh, requesting approval for $9,357.17 in curriculum grants, $463 to Kelsey O'Neill and uh, Niam Anand. Um, for Recipe for Reading Success, Program Alphabet Series, um, SPED Teachers um, at Woburn Street. Uh, $4,400 to Michelle Levesque, K-5 through STEM Coordinator uh, for STEM, Stimulating Thinking, Engagement, and Making. Um, $2,000 to Heather Peachy, Wildwood and Boutwell Librarian uh, for Immersive Reading with Vox Books for the Wildwood and Boutwell. $430 to Amy Marr, uh, fifth grade teacher at the West for Math Games, Play Changes Everything. Uh, $210 to Kelly Sullivan, SPED teacher at the West, for supporting fluency during reading instruction. $994 to Christine Holleran and Christine Stanford, uh, teachers at the Wildwood, for strengthening the home school connection decodable book library. 
$994 to Christine Holleran, and oops, that is a repetition, and $860 to Ashley uh, Rokobauer, uh, Strides teacher at WHS for unique learning system for Strides classroom. Thank you so much. And there is a motion. Would someone like to make that motion? Mr. Plowman, thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Smaha. All in favor? Excellent. And thank you, thank you to WEF, as always, for your generous, generous donation. We have warrants G2526, R25, L7071, 72, 73, 74, 75, FS5152, and 53. Is there a motion? Thank you, Mrs. Newhouse. Seconded by Mr. Ragsdale. All in favor? That's unanimous. How you doing, MJ? <laughs> <laughs> you <smell the> <laughs> I talk very quickly. I apologize. We have a, we'll have a recording just in case, but I'll try and slow down. <laughs> Payroll ending 3-2-2022. Thank you, Mr. Smaha. Seconded by Mr. Fennelly. All in favor? It's unanimous. And then we have SPED 27-28. Mrs. Newhouse. Seconded by Mrs. Plowman. All in favor? That is one abstention. Thank you. All right. And we're good. Superintendent's report, Dr. Brand. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, there are four items uh, tonight under the superintendent's report, um, and I'll follow in order. First off, uh, with an update on the MSBA or Mass School Building Authority. Great news. Uh, coming uh, fresh off of last night, and thank you so very much on behalf of the school committee uh, and uh, members of our town for the successful turnout that we saw last evening uh, and a successful passing of the uh, successful appropriation of funds to allow uh, the district and allow the town to move forward in the MSBA partnership program uh, and move forward towards feasibility study. Um, it certainly was a, a, a partnership effort of, uh, upon many and uh, really so very, very grateful for the residents who took the time out of their evening to come out. Uh, so uh, very briefly, the next things and what follows, I know probably questions on many of mine. Uh, there are a couple of uh, different things left that um, are part of this current phase that we're in. We expect to be certifying enrollment in short, uh, in short order, and we, we look uh, to receive that from the MSBA shortly. Uh, there are there's some other paperwork that uh, goes along with that. Uh, the uh, appropriate documentation of the successful vote last evening. Um, and then um, the final step, and most important, will be uh, that the, the town will be, uh, we expect to be uh, invited into feasibility study, as they term it, uh, by the board of directors of the Mass School Building Authority. And our understanding is that date is scheduled for April 27th. So um, nothing imminent, not right away, some background paperwork uh, and such, but we're, we're onwards and we're upwards and we're going in the right direction. And um, so uh, again, a thank you to the town who recognized uh, this important need to address. Uh, uh, the next item, uh, leadership uh, search updates. Uh, there are two memos in the packet uh, this evening. I won't speak at, at great length uh, with the first one, but um, just to share with you the announcement and the good news that we are uh, excited to have Miss Kathleen Bissell, who uh, will be joining us as the next principal of the Wildwood Early Childhood Center. Uh, she will officially be joining us after April, uh, after the April uh, vacation break. Uh, Ms. Bissell comes to us from the Amesbury Public Schools. You can read a little bit more about her, uh, her recent professional endeavors and the search process that went along with that. And we will look to uh, hopefully have her come and introduce you to you as a committee and to the community uh, in the very near future. Uh, the other memo that is in the, uh, in the packet uh, has to do with uh, the high school. and. Um, uh, if I may, uh, ask uh, Mr. Gendron, who is with us tonight, to come forward. Uh, Ryan Gendron is uh, a pleasure to introduce him to our school committee, our community, uh, as the next uh, principal of the Wilmington High School. Uh, just to give a couple of words about uh, Mr. Gendron. He, he currently is the associate principal at the Waltham High School, and uh, he has a range of experiences. Uh, working in a variety of educational communities, both here in Massachusetts as well a little bit farther afield in Virginia. Uh, when he returned to Massachusetts uh, a number of years ago, he joined Lexington Public Schools, where he served there as a teacher for some time, completed his administrative internship then, 
and moved on and was appointed in 2018 to his current role, again, as mentioned, as the associate principal. Uh, as part of this search process, as we do for all of these administrative searches or leadership searches, uh, we conduct site visits. And we took a team of folks, uh, many of the central office team, as well as uh, one of our CTL uh, leaders here, and we visited all of the four semifinalists, one of which obviously was Mr. Gendron's site. We spent uh, the better part of a day meeting with a vast array of students, with staff, educational leaders, and members of the community. And it was really, really a very impressive uh, display of folks who came forward to speak on behalf of Mr. Gendron. Um, and uh, the feedback through that process identified Mr. Gendron as a leader who is compassionate, who's caring, and is solution oriented. And with all of that, we're so glad to have him here, have him join us at the high school and uh, the community of Wilmington. Welcome, Mr. Gendron. Welcome. Thanks for being here. We already have questions. Mrs. Burns. <laughs> 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 so, Superintendent Reed, Yes, he had a lot of good things to say about Wilmington. <laughs> Um, thank you, and thank you everyone for having me. Thank you, Dr. Brand. Um, you know, I just wanted to say uh, how excited and honored I am to be selected as the next principal of Wilmington High School. Uh, throughout the search process, I met so many incredible students and staff members and families and administrators, um, and I'm really looking forward to meeting all the stakeholders of the WHS community to ensure a world-class education for all the students in Wilmington. Uh, I can't wait to get started. Go Wildcats, and I'll be talking to you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank Welcome. You. Okay, uh, the, uh, the next, thank you, sir. Uh, the next item uh, is, uh, does involve a presentation, and this will be, um, uh, this will be uh, part of the uh, summary and update of the middle school um, and high school exit survey results. Uh, the uh, PowerPoint here, uh, is in the packet for those members of the community who are interested in um, in following along. So uh, to start, I think, um, I, I know certainly members of this committee are well aware, but I also know many in the community are aware that um, there has been uh, a number of discussions and growing interest uh, in, recent, uh, in the recent time period around uh, the decline in enrollment um, that we are experiencing here uh, in the Wilmington Public Schools. Um, for the most part, that decline has been felt at the secondary level um, and has been discussed previously. Uh, the, the large focus of that decline centers specifically around the, uh, the exiting from the school district of students who are transitioning from eighth to ninth grade, or of course from the middle to the high school. Uh, in the slides that follow, um, my intention here tonight is to, um, just as some context, provide you with a snapshot of enrollment trends in Massachusetts because I think that there's relevancy to that. Um, as it relates to this, this topic, uh, to provide a little bit more detailed information regarding the Shawshank Tech School, something that we talked about as well, uh, and of course, um, the results of the recently completed exit survey from families uh, here at the secondary level in Wilmington. Um, I, I know that for those that read and follow a lot of the educational headlines, um, you have undoubtedly seen uh, this pop up, uh, and, and in fact, um, there was awareness around uh, slow declines in enrollment prior to COVID, prior to the pandemic. And um, this has been a growing trend and an area of focus. And I, I think certainly some questions and con some, some concerns certainly throughout the Commonwealth. Um, and that is, uh, centers around that downward trend in enrollment. And it's been throughout the state. Um, and there has been uh, either some degree of speculation and or uh, indeed awareness around what some of the driving factors may be for that decline in enrollment. And um, in large part, not necessarily in any particular order, they seem to center around uh, the price of housing, uh, immigration to decline in immigration, as well as lower birth rates. Uh, I know that this is more uh, of a discussion, I think, throughout largely the Northeast, as I understand it. I'm not that familiar with all of the data, but um, certainly I know that these are conversations and there's an interest that's been popping up. And, um, and I think that this is underscored and it is sort of, I guess, echoed, if you will, uh, throughout some of our surrounding communities. In no way is this an analysis of, of all our communities, but I just think it, it might be worthy to note for those that might be overly concerned about Wilmington just itself, are we uh, an anomaly? Uh, how do we compare to our surrounding communities? This is data that comes directly from the Department of Education's website. And, um, Quite honestly, this was just an effort to grab a couple of 
different years. There was nothing necessarily specific to the years that were, uh, that were grabbed. And I, and I will point out, all of this information is available publicly um, on the Department of Education's website. So um, out of interest, uh, grabbed or plucked, if you will, 2013 and 2014. 2018, 2019, which was, I guess, I suppose, with some deliberacy going into the pandemic, and then 21, 22, where we see uh, we are right now. And uh, uh, a range of some of the surrounding communities, and you can see where their enrollment, uh, that is all obviously in the thousands, uh, Wreck of Burlington, et cetera, you can see where Wilmington falls. And down the very, very bottom is the state. And um, uh, overall, the decline in enrollment of students uh, in the state from fiscal year 19, or the 2018-19 school year, is uh, just a little bit over 40,000 statewide. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the trend data throughout the other communities there. So I just again, in the context of this conversation, I think it's somewhat worthy to note. Uh, shifting gears a little bit to the Shawshank Tech. Um, of course, uh, an area of also some discussion and some interest around uh, where it is that the predominant number of our students who are, um, who are exiting the school system uh, travel to and where they pursue their high school uh, educational experience. Um, the information here is kindly uh, shared uh, from, uh, from Shawshank Tech with us. All of the information here has been shared through their school committee or their, in their respective school uh, community as well. Um, and so what you see here on this slide is uh, this is really pretty fresh data, if you will, uh, quite recent, in fact. And what it shows you is the various classes uh, of students the total number of applications for the uh, five member districts. Uh, Wilmington is one of five. I know many know that, but perhaps not everyone. Bedford, Billerica, Burlington, Tewksbury. Uh, you can see as of January 25th, the total number of applications there across all of those districts. The percentage by town, um, and then correspondingly for the, for the different classes. Um, there has been some interest that's also growing around, um, you know, what is it that Wilmington students are pursuing uh, for those that are moving on to the, uh, the Shawshank Technical School. Uh, and so what follows here uh, is information around those sort of courses of study. But to note, uh, it's not the ninth grade. Uh, as we understand it, the ninth grade is uh, a general sort of year for students and they don't have to, it's an exploratory type year, and so they don't have to specify uh, until the end of the, their, towards the end of their freshman year. I know this is tough on this slide, but for those that are looking more closely at the uh, slide deck, you can see the, the, the array of um, uh, different pathways programmatically that students uh, from Wilmington specifically, and I, I, if I, I did say that, sorry, but Wilmington students are pursuing. Uh, again, thank you to Shashin Tech for sharing this information with us. So uh, shifting to the, uh, really the heart of this interest, and that was, as discussed previously, trying to better understand perhaps what some of the motivating forces might be of our students and families who are opting to um, explore or pursue education outside of Wilmington for, high, for their high school years. Uh, in January, uh, the latter part of January, a uh, survey was sent out to families at the secondary level, and by secondary, of course, I mean the middle school and high school. Uh, in some total, and so this was all through our listserv, our email listserv. We, we don't have direct access or we don't keep, uh, at least to my knowledge, we don't keep uh, an email active for a family who has completely exited the school system. Uh, we use our student uh, database and so that's where we access that. So 1,384 families were uh, sent the survey, 281 responded. You can see uh, the breakdown for uh, from which rather families who responded in the corresponding uh, grade level of students that they had. Uh, and you can see uh, the largest number of respondents was at the eighth grade level. Uh, these come directly from the survey. We, we administered this through the Google platform. Um, and so these graphs are taken directly from the data that uh, was gathered for the, from those 281 respondents. And. Uh, for those that are parent, were parent guardians of students currently in the eighth grade, uh, we were interested in better, uh, better understanding what their plans were for the 2022-23 20, school year. And based upon those responses, um, 
uh, you can see the percentage breakdown uh, with the, uh, the choices for that question of yes, uh, no, or uncertain. We also probed uh, that with the from the perspective uh, or the current thinking of our sixth and seventh grade families. And that's on the right-hand side of the screen, and you can see that pie chart there. Uh, and those respond to the respondents, uh, 150 there that responded there. Um, but certainly what catches those that look at this, my, and my attention most certainly is uh, the uncertainty at this point in time. Um, almost half of our current sixth and seventh grade families. Uh, and, and so I think that that's, that's very interesting and um, something that uh, certainly a lot of that catches the attention. Uh, motivating factors that um, the respondents shared uh, that uh, were sort of at the root of their interest in exploring or their plans to explore a different high school experience. Now there's a lot of data and information on here. The left hand side is just the full um, uh, the, the, the full code or the full sort of the answer key there um, because it's cut off on that bar graph. Uh, but you can see um, that uh, there's a lot of interest in some key areas in particular, uh, post high school opportunities and, and that as an example that we tried to orientate the thinking around with such things as college admissions or, or employment. Um, and you can see the range of other specific academic programs, people who may have been interested in athletic opportunities and so on. Um, there were a couple of open response questions on this survey. And, um, and so this, the, the slides that follow highlight what I would identify as the themes um, from those who took the time to provide us with their thoughts uh, in the open-ended questions that follow rationale for sending students. Um, this was an other category, uh, sort of a catch-all, and so these identify what I would share with you as sort of the dominant themes from the, um, from the in this case for this question, 72 responses. Uh, again, better post-high school opportunities, more rigorous coursework, uh, past experiences in the school system that may not have been deemed favorable or, or were concerning or problematic. Um, particularly at the middle school was, was, a, was a theme uh, that popped up a number of times. Uh, desire to pursue a trade, certainly. Uh, some evidence of concern with discipline. And, um, and it's certainly not last or least on that list, but number of, um, a number of comments around just in general the frustration with uh, through the pandemic and what public education systems uh, have faced and the challenges uh, therein. There were a number of respondents who um, specifically identified their interest or their plans to pursue enhanced educational outcomes that were different than here at the high school. Um, again, some themes, uh, certainly technical education, hands-on teaching uh, was, was quite prominent. Um, there was some pointing or suggestion that the course selection and the array, array of options here at the high school were perhaps too limited for what they were looking for. In particular, uh, the belief by some that STEM, the STEM areas were lacking or are lacking here at the high school. Uh, there certainly were a number of respondents who pointed to such things as, um, you know, the, the types of trades or the types of educational experiences that indeed the technical school provides, uh, such as Shashin Tech Nursing art, plumbing, and so on, um, and uh, some of the other themes there. The, uh, the last open response question uh, included just a general and broad category, also other factors. Uh, there was a lot of overlap, I would suggest, through the responses. I think you probably can see here, but I, I tried to pull out and, and share with you some of the other, uh, some of the other things that popped up um, uh, as, uh, from the feedback and, and from the reading through there. So next steps. You know, this was our first effort and to certainly during my, my tenure, this is the first time that we have uh, put, uh, tried to push out a whole sort of a holistic, and by that I mean tapping into the middle school and high school families. Uh, the first time that we tried to gather this exit data, if you will. Um, I, I, it leads to the question of so now what? And what do we do with this and, and where do we go from here? Um, obviously, uh, I, I should start by saying that the, you know that the total number of responses was a, a, one might suggest was 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 reasonable was was decent. I, I think it falls in this just just yeah. Help me out. 
statistically significant range, but um, there were clearly a lot of families who did not um, do not share with us. And look, at we all recognize, and I do as well, survey fatigue and limitations therein. But I, I suppose it's a start. But I do think we need to think about this more uh, on a on a deeper level. How do we gather information uh, from families, from students who are uh, who are planning to or who have made the decision to leave Wilmington? We've we've talked about this certainly around this table before and and at other tables uh, throughout the community as of late. I think that we absolutely need to shift our thinking in a broader and more strategic way. That going back to that one data point of approximately half of our sixth and seventh grade families are uncertain as to whether or not Wilmington High School is going to be for them. Um, I think we need to think more strategically about how and what it is that we provide information so that families and students are aware of what sits here in this wonderful building. You know, to use the phrase, we are not at all the only game in town, the only option for families. And that's a good thing on one level, on one level but on the other level, on the other hand, um, this is and presents for us a significant challenge and I would also say <laughs> a much necessary or needed opportunity. Um, and I think we absolutely have to uh, the final bullet there, think about how we can engage our students, our families, um, our, our, our stakeholders here around what's important for their future, what's important to consider um, at the middle school level and, and really highlight for them what the various paths are. Um, clearly many are well aware of it, whether it's for an older sibling in their family. But it would be deeply problematic, uh, I think, for us all if families or students were making decisions that perhaps weren't rooted on educational uh, decisions or sound rationale and that we're getting sort of swayed in a different direction that may not be specifically tied to their awareness of which path they want to pursue. What is it that they want to study? And that's hard for a young person certainly to do so, but um, I think we need to take this opportunity to think more broadly about that. Um, so that uh, that is it, and I welcome any questions or thoughts you have. Certainly, there's lots more we have to do with this, and I'm, <clears throat> I certainly welcome the collective thoughts, if not tonight, um, but at a future point in time of those around this table. Thank you. I have so many, but I will pause and look at my colleagues to see who would someone else like to start. Oh, I can start. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a little bit of a list. You sure? Yeah. Okay. So my first, um, my first thought with the survey, so I'm gonna try and give us sort of some action steps. I found the survey to be framed for those leaving Wilmington Public Schools, not framed for someone like me who's planning on staying, well me, my son. So it felt sort of, so, and I understood that, but I also didn't feel like it gave us any information about why people might stay, which I think would be sort of a next step. I think you'd probably wanna know why I chose Wilmington High School, why my family and I chose Wilmington High for Hannah and why we're probably going to choose that for our son. So I didn't feel like there was any room for that. So I feel like this is one side of the story and all of those unknowns, I could see people looking at it and going, well, geez, I don't, I don't know. It, are we supposed to be leaving? So I kind of was like, as I was doing it, I was like, oh, I'm not even sure I'm supposed to be doing this. So I just wanted to put that out there as a, as a parent of a child in that grade. I felt like it was sort of skewed. Um, and then my next action step, well, you've already said this, you know, just not marketing well. People don't know what to expect at the high school, and this brings me to we're not telling our story well, right? And I think that that's problematic for a number of reasons, but really problematic because I'm actually not sure families are always making a decision based on facts, which you've alluded to at the end there. Like, do they really know what they're looking for? Do they really know what they're going to get if they come here or don't come here? And I think that that's, that can actually be a disservice if we're not doing a better job of that. So that's sort of my, here are the things I think we can do to like we can attend to right we can attend to that future planning piece we can attend to making sure our course selection is more clear i heard the middle school students say that we were going into the middle school to talk to them about course selection i don't know if that's happened before maybe that's i don't remember if my daughter had that level of guidance at this point in eighth grade, maybe that's an, I don't know, but I think that's great. Like, I'm like, oh, that's good, because they're stepping in and they're saying, hey, these are the options that are available to you. Um, 
there's this technology piece, so that's clearly a draw, and I think that that's something we need to, they need, we need to look at or we, at the programs of study. And we've done some of that with the programs of study, so there's that piece. But then there's this, this culture piece, which I think we really do need to, not we necessarily, I mean we as a district, I don't mean the school committee members, but as a district, I can get into a little bit. You know, is it, what is happening that is, make help, help having a family say something like mm, this district isn't for me I think that we really do need to think pretty deeply about that and so that brings me to sort of I have more points but I'll stop there my final point is who is talking to the children who's surveying the kids are we sitting with focus groups of middle school and maybe intermediate kids and saying what are your thoughts do you feel seen here do you feel like this is a place for you do you not feel like this is a place so I'm sort of like I get all the family stuff but I'm like I feel like we're missing a kind of a huge group here and kids can tell a really good story about how they're feeling at that school or at the middle or the intermediates and I think we need to invest in some of that so I'll stop there I saw Melissa and then Joe sorry this data because parents completed this and kids completed that and I'd like to look at whether there's alignment there <clears throat> or whether there are gaps there um, I know that there you know have been child experiences that were um, you know where kids were not didn't have a great experience um, but I actually wonder if it's more parents that are not feeling connected, you know, um, to the culture of the middle school. So when I hear these, our representatives come and talk tonight, I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was going on at the middle school. And I just don't feel like as a parent that I should be having to receive or get that information from a school committee meeting. I mean, I'm, I'm in the position where this is great. I have this privilege to be here and hear that, but so many parents are not. Um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to look at a comparison of those two surveys and data and, and see if there is consistency there or, or not. I was gonna feedback off that as well. I just feel like you hear too much um, from parents that the culture at the middle school is what's sending them away. Um, those who have stuck it out seem to love the high school. Mm -hmm. if, you know, of course you're gonna have your ones and twos are not happy all the way through, but you're never gonna make everybody fully happy. But I think, you know, a lot of this is, the next step seem to be geared at, you know, what can we do at the high school level? But I think we really need to dig deeper into the culture and what's going on at the middle school because I think most of what's happening at the high school is a good story and you know yes we definitely need to um, put that out there better than we have been because I do think too many of our students at the middle school they just have a bad taste in their mouth for some reason and they don't know what the paths are up here at the high school. You know, the Shawshine Tech is in there right from, seems like right from September, this is what we have to offer, come to our open houses. You know, they're offering a lot. Same with any of these private schools. I mean, they're starting, you know, October, November and recruiting kids. And we haven't said anything. I mean, we could almost start when they enter sixth grade, like this is what the high school is about. Like we have, the focus of these kids better than these other schools do and why, you know, maybe we can, you know, offer what we have good sooner um, before they start looking outside. But I think the bigger piece of that is why do so many families have a bad taste from the middle school? I mean, I know a lot of that was all the turnover we've had and maybe now with more consistency that'll go away, but somehow we need to change the mindset of the community that we've made some of these changes as more things happening and show them that maybe it's not all bad 
Um, and if you're still having bad experiences there, what are they? How can we fix them? You know, is it a systemic issue? Is it a one-off issue? Um, but I think too many people are just hearing the middle school is horrible and they just walk away. Mr. Smarnoff? Yeah, I, I really I agree with um, with what you're saying, uh, Joe, too. The, the idea of we need to sell the high school, right? That's a priority. But also really dive into the culture at the middle school. Um, you know, I, I look at these rates and I see, um, you know, the, the rate of loss of, of students when I, when, I, when I look at them, you know, sort of in that comparison between the other districts, we're, we're at three times the rate of the state. And because we're, you know, from, we're like, it's like 12%, 12 and a half percent loss rate versus the next closest town is Reading, which is at 8.6% in terms of, in terms of loss um, from 19 to, to 21. And I think it clearly has a lot to do with the, with the middle school. I mean, there's, there's clearly, in my mind anyway, there's clearly a, a huge problem with, with the middle school. Um, and we really need to um, continue to do this, to continue to survey kids. But I think having focus groups, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm really interested in finding out more of the, the middle school review, see how that's going. Um, but like, like Joe was saying, there are, you know, there is such a bad taste. Many families have just a bad taste in their mouth about the middle school, um, which was not my experience at, with my kids at the middle school at, at all. I, I thought it was, they had a great experience there. Um, but I know that's not true for everybody. So we really need to figure out what it is. Is it just a turnover in leadership or, you know, what's, what's going on there? And I think, um, I think really deciding, you know, really taking a look at it and really saying, you know, you know like we have, we have a problem. Um, well, and, and I'll say, I'm just going to jump, I'm sorry, but I think that, I mean, I want to be careful. I mean, I'm not disparaging the middle school and I think actually, I'm, 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 no, so, I know. Let me clarify, that's not what I, no, I'm no, not no, saying that. No, 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 I'm saying, I know we're not, I know none of us are saying that, but I don't want people to then listen and be like, wow, they, I mean, I think what we're saying, and I don't actually think it's, I mean, I too have had good experiences there and I think we have fantastic teachers there. We have strong curriculum. We have really good systems in place. Like there's actually, I think a lot, I mean, and this is just from a perspective of, I've only had two kids go through, but there's a lot that's going very, very well. I think middle school's a hard age, regardless. I think middle schools everywhere are, have, a hard, have a harder time than they might at the elementary and the, and the high school. But I also think there are probably some fixes that just have not been looked at and I'm, not, for example, more standards-based as opposed to such a heavy focus on grading, for example, right? So what are we doing there that's sort of saying, hmm, I'm not sure this is a place for me. And then I think, what is so different about elementary and, and the intermediate versus the middle? And there's this feeling of we gotta get them ready for high school, we gotta get them ready for high school. But when they get to the high school, it's actually, it's quite different. It's a, it's, it's, it's not, it's obviously grading, but there's a little bit of a different feel around grading here than there is. So I'm just like, wait, let's look at this for ex as one issue and say, so I don't think it's the middle school, I think it's a hard age. I think there's a huge shift from elementary to middle, and there are things we can really look at and focus on by talking to kids and f teachers and families and say, okay, so let's actually make some changes here that are going to really affect kids in different ways, not just these like, we need more, of course we need more stability. Every school needs stability, every, I mean, that's of course. David, you had your hand up, or Melissa had her hand up. Go ahead, Dave. Yes, Dave. <clears throat> so issues, um, issues like this involve both perception and reality, and you need to, I think, tackle them in, in both areas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've mentioned before that we need to sort of tell our story better, that we need to, you know, market the good things that are happen happening, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we, you know, continue to emphasize those good things and make sure that they are, in fact, there. Uh, that you can't, you know, marketing sometimes has a, a, a bad reputation because it sounds like you're just trying to, you know, use psychological tricks to just, like, you know, convince people it's all flim-flam. Uh, <laughs> but people will realize pretty quickly if there's anything actually underneath the claims that you're making. And so we have to look at it at, on, on both sides. That there's, you know, you can, you can have great things, but if the perception isn't there, then it kind of doesn't matter. But in the end, 
you know, you can only perceive, people can only have perceptions for so long that are not backed up by reality. So you really have to um, have to tackle both sides of that. Um, the other thing that I want to put out there is the idea that I think we need to be kind of setting this expectation even earlier that the, the it's not just you know it's not just that we need to focus at looking at like the sixth and seventh grade but when we're talking about the elementary and the intermediate schools that we should be talking up the high school and finding opportunities for them to imagine themselves at the high school i mean a lot of sort of a lot of life is the images you have of like how you you know, imagine your future being and that you know there are, i think there are probably opportunities that we can get kids in our other schools to come to the high school for some kind of special event and then they can sort of see themselves here and picture themselves being one day like these other uh, students that they see. And that, you know, the, the more that you establish kind of just a, a baseline understanding that one day I'm gonna go to Wilmington High School, then, you know, for people who truly want a different path and want a different educational experience, fine, there are always going to be kids, you know, who want that. Um, but that just that there's sort of a baseline understanding that just like that Wilmington High School is where I'm going to go as I move up uh, as I move up through the district. And I think that starting starting earlier uh, and just creating that kind of you know base level understanding and expectation um, will also help us a lot. Yeah. And I do, I'm sorry, oh my goodness, what is happening to me? And usually I'm just I never talk till the end, Mrs. Burns. So I just want to say I think one of the best examples of what you've just spoken about is when the high school students do parades through their element, the younger schools, like with Wilburn Street or North, because it, it, it's, it's, it's a memory of capturing their academic career and, they, and their memories of school, as well as giving the, the younger students that, that one day they too will be cap and gown and, and graduating. And, and, and you know what I mean? I think that's a, it, I guess, age appropriate way of, of meeting. I, I, and I, I'm just, it just humbles me so much to see these kids because as we sit up on that stage every June, I remember these kids in my CCD class. I mean, they were only uh, seven, seven, eight year olds. And to see them young uh, men and women, you know, going off, you know, and starting, you know, post high school um, adventures, it's just, um, but, I, but I think, I, I love that piece. And I think that's a, a great way of, of um, meeting the means. Um, that we're discussing, so. So I'm partly feeling like we've had this discussion many times <laughs> as a committee, right? And at one point, I think we had decided as a committee to put the middle school on our agenda at least once a month, or we had talked about, let's keep this on the front burner. Um, so I want us to get back to that and perhaps to really develop some action points. So I love to hear that there are focus groups happening. Um, I'd love updates on that, you know, and sort of hear what, you know, what are, what are we gleaning from those focus groups? And um, I'd like to revisit, you know, the principal's um, entrance plan. I forget what that's specifically called. Um, energy plan, yeah. Um, and into just, um, get Dr. Cork's pulse on, you know, I feel like she is our, our best sort of um, potentially our, our guide in this process because she has the most contact with students and families um, and um, to just have a better sense of what are some of the actual steps and plans that we're working on actively right now. Um, I will just... Uh share with you it relates specifically to the middle school piece that um, you will recall that not that I forget times a blur but a, a number of weeks ago uh, we um, we did actually send out a, a fairly robust survey on the middle school level to parents students and staff uh, and we are anticipating those results to be finalized and back to us soon so that is a report that is uh, very comprehensive very comprehensive it is it, it and um, so that will certainly be something that will be coming before you as a committee in the community in short in short order I I can't commit to that to be the next meeting but if not soon thereafter uh, so that's one piece um, that I just want to share with you because it's certainly relevant to this discussion here too um, and um, 
the, the community, just to, just really quickly, I mean, I think, and I, I just, for, for as much as I know that you've been talking about it and I've been talking about it, and for those that are in the community, um, this can't or should not be, you know, I hope ever perceived as a desire not to have our high school students pursue an education at Shashin Tech or any other option that they might be interested in. Um, and I think that this is a complex, clearly, uh, scenario to try and unpack, you know, uh, of note. My understanding, just as a, a quick snapshot of the other communities here, is that Bedford is a community, historically, is very low in the number of students that they send. In fact, I believe in recent years in the single digits. I, I may be mistaken, but m I believe that uh, Bill Ricca had an adjustment in their numbers as a total of their population uh, that went downward when they moved, the eighth grade moved into the high school. Um, I believe that has rebounded, and, I, and please don't quote me, but that's my, that's my understanding. So I only share those things to say that at the larger level, there are certainly complex community issues at play here too, and I fully understand the discussion linking to you know, interest, concern, around the middle school level, but certainly there's so many elements to this, and I, you know, I think that's also just worthy to keep in mind as well, too. I also think that there's potential for just like trends, like amongst the students that talk about, you know, you know, the tech, and there's like social implications for kids, too. Um, and, you know, just my pulse on, last couple of grades that have that have gone through this system I do think that sometimes there's a lot of social pressure for kids to go and it's sort of like when things are trending they're trending um, and I so I I anticipate that the trends will will change but I but I do think that it behooves us to work towards you know shifting the trends for when it's appropriate to do so, you know. So it's, there's always going to be appropriateness for kids um, who are interested in, um, you know, the technical world to, to be there. And, that, and I'm so glad that, you know, we participate in that. Um, but I think that sometimes kids are going there because it's trending, too. All right, thank you. So I think, um, Mrs. Plowman, this idea of having it back on our agenda probably makes good sense. So maybe we'll mm -hmm. add that maybe just once a month at this point. But all righty. Wildwood. Uh, very briefly, the Wildwood School, uh, this is not related to MSBA, but specifically um, just to give the committee and the community where we're at, there has been over the last week and a half a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes. I cannot begin to tell you how complex uh, the movement. Um, on the surface, I recognize that uh, to the sort of the community looking in, it might be, well, you've got about 160 students and a handful of staff. How hard can it be? It is very difficult. We are closing a building. We are relocating programs into spaces we don't have. The plan and the update for you is this. We've, we've made those spaces, but it has not been easy. And for those you know interested in watching how we're doing this, we are, we've found and been able to secure appropriate space at three schools, the high school being one, the Woburn Street, and the Shawshine School. Um, it was not by, uh, it was not for desire or want to separate the Wildwood into three different schools as we temporarily closed the school to allow for the cleanup of the oil spill. But we had no other choice based upon a thorough analysis. Um, it, it, it means that we are not only um, relocating the Wildwood students and, and, and uh, teachers, but also, unfortunately, asking a number of staff in those, what we're calling the host schools, to also relocate. And so I just want to acknowledge that, unfortunately, this is having an impact on many, um, many students and ultimately many, many staff in, our, in those other schools. Uh, the staff at those schools have been great. The principals and leadership teams have been great working with us and my team as we try and find solutions. Um, this is still very much a work in process. There's a lot of, uh, there's just a array of collect complexity. I won't go through it all now, but from cares to food services to nursing, and the list is uh, miles long. Um, the plan right now, though, to share with you and, and information that has gone out actually uh, within the last short time period here to families. Uh, we, um, we are planning to 
with the assistance of public buildings, move the wildwood uh, necessary furniture and equipment uh, over the course of next weekend, so the weekend of the 19th and 20th. Um, the last day of school for students in Wildwood will be Friday, uh, the 19th, sorry, 18th. 18th. Uh, the movement will take place the 19th and 20th. Um, unfortunately, we felt like there was no other way to get at this but necessarily to suspend school or not have school for students at Wildwood uh, on Monday and Tuesday, uh, 21st and 22nd. Um, our staff will be working. They will be in their new locations, essentially unpacking all of the things that have made, their way, uh, made its way over. Um, we are planning uh, to offer optional walkthroughs of those sites for families and students who are interested in doing so on the afternoon of uh, the Tuesday, the 22nd, and school will resume on uh, Wednesday, the 23rd uh, of March. So a lot of activity go, uh, still underway, but I wanted to give you that, uh, that information again. Is, uh, I can say that comfortably. It's gone out to uh, all of the Wildwood families at this point. Um, so I'm happy to take any other questions. I'll keep certainly you posted and the community posted, but uh, folks are stepping up, um, collectively working really hard, um, and we will make the very best of this unfortunate situation, uh, keeping you know the Wildwood students and staff obviously at the forefront. Okay. Other questions about that? No. Just say thank you. I know. I know. Well, actually, I don't know the amount of work that's, but I can only imagine what this has been like for all of central office and administrators, so and teachers, so yeah. and not just at Wildwood, but at uh, these other buildings. So it's I can't even wrap my head around it, and I also can't believe that a plan that came we came up with so well, you came up so so quickly. So I think that you know we're grateful and um, and wish you good luck and yeah. next week. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, that brings us to old business, which is guidance, changes, discussion, that is, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, just before we move on, I actually, I know it's like, it feels like ages ago, but I want to jump way back to the beginning of the superintendent's report real quick, just to make two, two quick comments. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one was that uh, in uh, following on Dr. Brand's uh, gratitude for the result last night at special town meeting, I also just wanted to acknowledge that there were uh, so many people who came out last night that not everyone got into the meeting. Uh, there were people who were still in line outside the building in the cold waiting to come in to vote, including two, <laughs> including including two some of our, our own members. Uh, two of our members uh, here um, who didn't even make it inside the building for the vote, and, um, and it's, that, that was unfortunate. Um, but uh, having so many people come out and show support for this project and um, you know, help us help us move forward into the next stage is really gratifying, and um, and so also thank you to everyone who showed up, and um, especially people who <laughs> didn't even have the satisfaction in the end of casting the vote, but were there were there anyway, and it's it's so much appreciated um, that so many people came out. Uh, and then um, very just quickly on the Wildwell principal Wildwood principal announcement. Um, very excited to have Ms. Bissell join the district and wanted to say um, one more thank you to Sheila McAdams um, mm -hmm. for serving as the interim principal there for, uh, for all these months. But, uh, it was a, great, uh, a great turn that she did for us in that role and so I wanted to thank her once more. Thank you, absolutely. All right, are we good? Okay, now we are going to move on to old business and that is the guidance changes. Molly Dickerson and Linda Peters. Come on down. Sorry. You don't really, I don't think you actually have to have it in front of you, believe it or not. I think it catches you. Isn't that the way it works? So it's good here. It's good there. Yeah, that's why I've learned from WCT. So it's good to see everybody again. Um, you should have the slides that I'm going to go through. There's a lot of information. I thought it would be best to kind of revisit in the order that was originally presented with additional information. So that's um, where I'm hoping to go tonight. Um, am I supposed to? Is, ours? Do you have, is this up? I, <laughs> you don't have oh. this. Oh, we have it in the packet, though. Okay, so we are all set. Yeah, I mean, it'd be great to have it projected if you can track it down we'll in the yep. electronic packet. But, but yes, we have it. We all have it in front of us. Okay. So, no, continue. Okay. 
Um, so the first slide there is just the proposal about the GPA scale. We talked about this um, previously. So our current scale is that 4.3 scale, and we'd be moving to a standard 4.0 scale, which is really just the widespread scale used at the high school and college level. Um, that would be expected to be implemented for the class of 2026, so we wouldn't be making any changes for current high school students. That calculation would go into effect for the incoming freshman class and then be used from that point forward. The second slide just reviews the transition to the plus one scale weight for coursework. So I mentioned this in the previous presentation, but the way our scale is currently presented, students lose points for decreasing rigor which is just sort of a philosophical kind of frame that I would like to change in conversation with students, and it really is not the standard for high school. So we would like to move to a weighted scale where students earn additional points for additional rigor rather than subtracting points for um, removing rigor. So that scale, that plus one scale, is what's used at the state level when they uh, evaluate students at the, for the state universities and colleges, uh, so we just felt it was generally the most widespread used and would make the most sense to adopt here for our students to have the most accurate information as they prepare for post-secondary. Let me actually stop right there before you move on to the decile. Yep. Is there anything else with this? Because I think I, I certainly have a couple of questions and I'm not sure if others, I might be the only one who's just not, this isn't landing with me. <laughs> so I, I'm just trying to understand if we're moving, are you, okay? are you guys, is everything okay? What's happening, what's happening around here? Um, if we're moving to a 4.0, but, but, but really, you can have a 5.3. Am I reading that properly? So if you have all AP classes and you have all A pluses, you can actually have a 5.3 GPA? So that would be a weighted GPA. So we don't actually publish a weighted GPA. The unweighted for that student would be a 4.3 if that makes sense. It would still be 4.3. So we're not, so, so we're moving to a 4.0, but they can still actually get above a 4.0? So yes, so the okay. standard scale is a 4.0. At the college level, what you'll see is colleges don't give additional points for an A+. Plus. Right. That's generally standard. At the high school level, it varies. Um, so we talked about that a lot. Do we give students additional points for an A+, plus? do we not? Um, and ultimately, we decided to recommend still having an additional weight for an A+, plus just because that's the expectation that students have had in the past, and there are high schools that still have that option. So we wouldn't be unique in having an additional weight for a, or I shouldn't say weight, additional point for a 4.3 A plus, if that makes sense. It's, it's really just the yes. difference. I mean, it does make sense. I'm, I guess not, so I'll stop there, um, David. Uh, so let me just make sure that I'm on top of this, that the um, I, I think that part of what, what's a little confusing is it's saying that we're moving from a 4.3 to a 4.0 scale yep. when there's still a 4.3 hmm. at the A-plus level seems a little bit confusing. And it's, in fact, the, the levels, the numerical correspondence with the, with the letter grades doesn't actually change until you get down into the B-plus level or so when it starts being off a little bit by like a tenth of a, you know, of a, of a GPA point. Right. And so I think that might be a little bit part of the confusing. It's really just a sort of a restructuring of some of the lower down Corresponding, corresponding points. Right, um, yes. And then the, I think the other thing that I just want to make sure that I, I, I think I um, got this from the slides, is that um, the, the extra weight from the AP and the honors courses, that only, that weighted GPA is only used for awards at the, basically in the 12th grade. Right. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go on transcripts, it's not shown to colleges, it's, you know, the, the regular, you know, to 4.3 scale with, you know, with these new uh, correspondences that you put in here. Correct. That's sort of the, the official one, and it's almost, it's just an internal thing that we use for certain uh, purposes and awards at the end of 12th grade. That's, that's really all the way to GPA is for. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you. <laughs> 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 so, so let me follow up. So thank you, David. Um, so if a student takes a push, yep. right, AP US history, and they get an A, yeah. and someone who takes college prep gets an A plus. Yep. You're saying outside of Wilmington High, that college prep student has a higher GPA. A higher 
Weighted unweighted. Unweighted. Which is Correct. what colleges will say. Correct. So what is the motivate? I mean, other than obviously they get college credit, what is the motivation for potentially taking a very rigorous, challenging AP course yep. and maybe getting a, a B, which yep. is fine, yeah. when they could have taken honors and gotten an A plus? For example, what's the motivation here for it, so I, for a child to do that when they know they can get straight A's if they stay in college prep? Is it just the awards at the end of, and obviously the reward of taking rigorous, all, all of that, right? But aside from that, when they go to apply to college, what's the reward there? So I should preface that by saying unweighted GPA is, is vastly standard at the college level. So it, reporting a weighted GPA out of high school would be very unusual for us. So that is the standard when students apply to college. In terms of how it's uh, accounted for, that's where you're looking at rank. So a student's GPA would give you the college a sense of what kind of grades they got just numerically. And then the rank would give the college a sense of what was the rigor of the coursework in comparison to the peer group. So okay. a student who potentially had an A in an, a CP course compared to a student who had an A in an AP course, that student in the AP course earns additional weight, which means their rank is higher when the rank is calculated. So their GPA may be the same, but one student's rank will end up being higher than another. Okay. Thank you. Other questions on this piece before we move? Melissa, you look like you might have one. You both asked my question. I'm just still processing. Okay. I'm still, and I'm, I am, and I understand many schools have this A+. Plus. There is a piece as we move into the next part of this presentation that talks so much about social emotional learning, which I think was my push the first time. And I really do want it to take that seriously. And I'm, I'm battling with this. And I'm not suggesting we get rid of the A+, plus, but it is truly, a, I'm really, it's a quandary for me because I'm like, ah. Is this what we really want for our kids? And this is why I had said to, you know, can we have Christine Murray talk with us about, like, are we thinking deeply enough about what are we doing to those, those high achievers when they are, I mean, I've heard around, oh, if I don't get an A plus, then I, I've already lost. I've already lost. The, and I'm like, oh, gosh, an A is great. I teach at the university. You just get A's. You, you don't get an A+. Plus. There is just an A, right? So I'm trying to like wrap my head around, are we really attending to their social emotional health? Are we concerned about that? Or do we think actually it's fine to do that because they're going to just continue to do extra credit and revise and do whatever it is they need to do? It's funny because I had the same exact question and lucky for me, my sister's a um, school counselor. And I said, look, I want to let you know, this is where I kind of stand. Can you give me a broader perspective and understanding as it impacts it? And granted, she's in an urban district. So I know with in looking at this presentation, you know, especially taking away the con talking about maybe doing away with the, the super, you know, the, the class ranks and such. She said, you have no idea how many students obsess over that. They, they can barely even function. And, and they do become so depressed that if they don't get that higher mark, they have the fear of failure, the fear of going to college. So by removing it from all peers, nobody knows. Nobody knows. And she said it, it offers um, an equity where they can, there's, the higher achievers are still going to uh, want to achieve. But nobody is, is feeling ostracized or segregated by um, those who are more prone to academics than others. And I'm not explaining it as well as my sister did, but um, I, I did have to ask that question myself, um, especially in this uh, modern day and time from when I went through the process of it, so. Um, but I think that, on, I mean, on some level, whether it's an A plus or an A is not gonna solve the problem. If you have a numerical scale and you just say, well, um, that a, you know, a 96 to a 99 is now going to be an A instead of an A+. Plus. Now just the top students are just gunning for that same numerical score, and it's just the new top, top score is an A. So I don't, I don't think that that really solves much of the issue. Now, rank is definitely a different, a different thing. Um, but I, I think as far as the grading scale, that's just kind of arbitrary, but just you know, yeah. making it clean and consistent with what colleges expect and other schools do. Um, seems to be a, kind of a, a, a win 
for, for us. And I don't think it'll solve that problem whether we have a 4.3 or a 4.0. Okay. Thanks. All right. Anything else? No. All right. So the next slide is just a review of the recommendation for transitioning to a reported decile rank while maintaining the academic recognition. So I think I gathered some information that I'm going to share with you and you've already had a chance to review. But I think it's important to just re revisit this sense that I, we're not making a recommendation to change our recognitions at this point in time, in part just because I, I, from a department standpoint, I don't feel like we have enough information to make that kind of change at this time. We haven't um, surveyed our students and our greater community about that. So that's not a recommendation um, I made in this proposal, but the proposal really is talking about how we report information to colleges and changing the way that we report. The same information exists, we're just talking about changing the way that we report it on behalf of our students. So the next, I'm looking at a slide, um, you should have a slide there that says GPA and one, there's an arrow that goes this way to unweighted and an arrow that goes this way to weighted. So. Oh, that's my fault. Hey, very helpful. <laughs> okay, great. Well, now I'm looking at the slide that I was referring to. Um, so the unweighted GPA is based on our current 4.3 scale, which we are making the proposal for the 4.0 scale. Points are assigned to the final course grade that a student earns. That GPA is reported to students, it's reported to colleges, it's reported on the student's transcript, and it's recorded in Naviance. So when a student goes to apply to college, it's there for them to compare themselves to other students, and it also populates on the student's transcript when the counselor sends information for the student. The weighted GPA is happening behind the scenes. So the weight comes in with that new potential scale where a student in an honors class would earn an additional 0.5 points and a student in an AP class would earn an additional one point. But that calculation happens, um, like you were saying, sort of behind the scenes, behind the curtain. It's never published. It's not shared with students. It's not given to colleges. It's not reported on a student's transcript. It's really just used to determine the student's rank which is reported, which we'll talk a little bit more about. So what is rank used for? So we're just talking about the end of year recognitions in grade 12, and then providing colleges with information to help them evaluate our students as applicants. That's the only thing that Wilmington High School uses class rank for. When we're talking about grade level, I just wanna make this clear. A student in grade nine to 11 does not have a rank. That calculation could be done. As I said, it all happens kind of behind the scenes, but it's never um, even used until a student reaches the end of their junior year going into senior year. In grades nine to 11, there are end of year recognitions. So we do acknowledge our top five students, which I'll talk about on another slide, but that's not based on the student's uh, GPA. It's not based on their rank. In grade 12, the rank is calculated officially for the first time at the end of grade 11 going into grade 12. So our goal as a department is to provide a transcript to every student over the summer. They have their official GPA and their official rank with an official transcript going into their senior year. So they know going into 12th grade where they stand in terms of GPA and rank. Rank is reported to colleges on the student's transcript. Uh, there's an example later in the uh, slideshow, but as a specific number. So right now we would potentially say the student is ranked 34 out of 205. And like I said, the recognitions at the end of the year in senior year are based on rank. So at the end of the year in grades nine to 11, it's based on a simple average. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But in grade 12, it does switch to, um, it's based on the student's ranked uh, space. So this is the end of the year recognition just in more detail. So our students in grades nine to 11 are recognized with a simple average. That is only numerical based on how the student has done in their coursework. It's not, they are not assigned points. So it's not based on GPA. It's not based on rank. It's just the numerical average of the student. So in grade nine, for example, that calculation is based on three quarters. In 10th grade, that calculation is based on seven quarters, so it's calculated at the end of quarter three. 
for grade 12, it's also calculated at the end of quarter three, but it is based on a weighted GPA or rank. So our students who are acknowledged at graduation as our valedictorian, salutatorian, and essayist are our ranked one, two, and three students, and our ranked four through 10 students are recognized as top 10 in, at uh, graduation or at the end of senior year. So when we were talking about making this proposal, we were considering <coughs> several different factors, which I've listed on the slide and just kept them on the um, next slides just so that you have them to reference. So we were thinking about how do we make sure that we're in line with our peer districts and make sure that we're following the prevailing trends in education, that we are following best practice in this area. How do we make sure that we are minimizing any kind of harm that might come to our students as applicants? We certainly don't want to put anybody at a disadvantage when they apply to college um, by providing potentially too much information? Um, is there a way for us to share information with the college that does not, that minimizes that impact on our students? And as we were talking about just briefly earlier, to think about how rank and GPA affect our students social emotionally and are we, um, are we addressing that in a way that is potentially equitable to all students, but also gives the colleges the information they need without exacerbating an issue that um, we know exists for our students. So this slide is just talking about the academic history and the context that we were considering. So class rank in general has become of decreasing importance at the college landscape. We looked at information from the National Association of College Admission Counseling, which does a survey of colleges every year. So they survey about 200 colleges. They ask them to rank, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. um, the factors in the college admissions process and how important they are to evaluating an applicant. So class rank is on that list. And in 2014, the number of colleges that said class rank was either considerably or moderately important was 52%. And as we moved even just five years into 2019, that percentage has decreased to 38%. So as it may be a chicken and the egg kind of situation, as more high schools eliminate rank, more colleges are saying it's not important. And as a result, more high schools continue to eliminate rank. So I do expect um, that that trend will continue, that rank will become less and less important on the college landscape. And if that's the case, do we have an opportunity to address it, um, to change the way that we're using it in a way that is more um, beneficial to our students or is, has less of a negative impact on our students? Um, we also looked at our local districts. So out of the ones that we were surveying in our sort of peer group, Seven of them have eliminated class rank completely. That, that wasn't necessarily a move that we felt like we could go forward with at this time, just because of all the, the community factors at play here and um, that we haven't had a chance to really investigate in depth. And the communities that have done that are, tend to be different from Wilmington. The ones that are most similar to us are our peer, peer group tend to have changed to a decile or a percentile rank. So they're still providing some kind of um, gauge for their students of where they fall within their peer group, but they're not giving that specific rank like we are. Um, we actually, I think we might have been the only one at this point that is still giving an exact class rank. Um, so to the next, I, this slide. So. Talking about, so that's the sort of academic part of this conversation, the college landscape part of the conversation. We also did consider how our students are affected by class rank and GPA. I know it can be, um, it can be a, a hot spot. It can be a point of um, frustration. It can be a point of stress. Can, um, it can be very difficult for students to navigate, um, especially at that higher level where they do feel a sense of competition. Fortunately, not all of our students feel that way about it, but there is a, a large group that is affected in that way. So we looked at our youth risk behavior survey results from 2021, where 41% of our students reported that school demands and expectations do cause them negative stress. There were a list of uh, choices for students 
to choose what caused them the most negative stress. And for our students, that was the primary answer. 41% of them responded that school was the primary source of negative stress. We also looked at the U.S. Surgeon General's Advisory, which came out um, earlier this year as a result of the pandemic and looking at the trends in adolescent uh, mental health and identifying some of the risks and how schools and communities and um, other you know, stakeholders or groups of people could address some of those concerns. And one of those in that report was talking about academic pressure as a contributor to the mental health concerns that are growing for the teenage population in particular. So those were all, that was all part of our kind of assessment of where we stand, where do we go, um, how do we balance these different priorities. So I made it as a balance on my slides just to give you a sense of um, there are competing priorities, I think, and as we looked at this information to consider how do we address the anxiety or stress that might be caused by this for our students while also still potentially providing information to colleges and to our students, honestly, about where they fall within their peer group because it can be an important piece of information. It can be motivating for some students when they you know, get their information and find out oh, my, I didn't realize that you know, those C's or D's in my freshman year made that much of a difference, but I still have time to change, I still have time to move forward. And so it can be motivating for students. Um, but so we were looking at these two priorities and how to balance them between each other. So, so this was kind of our, these few couple of slides were our what I call like thought experiments, where we looked at how, what things would change if we prioritized one category over another or at the expense of the other. So if we're looking at minimizing anxiety and stress, for our students, we could do a lot of things. We could eliminate class rank completely. We would not report it to colleges. We would not report the students' course selection rigor. We could eliminate our top recognitions for our students in grades nine to 11. We could eliminate our recognitions for students in grade 12. And we could eliminate our recognition for the valedictorian, salutatorian, essayist. Um, so that's sort of what we felt it might look like if we were to maximize um, or prioritize only the anxiety and stress of our students um, in a way that would potentially change a lot of practices that we have currently. The second one I, I looked at, we looked at together, potentially it turned out there were a lot of the things that we were doing. So when we look at providing colleges with information about our students and we look at what would that look like, so we would report our exact rank, we would report our students' course selection, we would recognize our top students, all of those things um, potentially would be on the side of giving colleges information about our students and, and maybe not considering the impact of that on our student body. So that, and like I said, it sort of turned out that that's kind of where we fall right now. That wasn't intentional, it just kind of came out that way as we thought through what it might look like. So the next slide is where we looked at tried to look at where can we balance and where can we find um, the middle ground here of, of what makes sense for our student body but also what makes sense for us as we prepare students to go off to college. So, and this is our proposal. So we would potentially be changing our class rank from an exact rank to a decile, um, which I'll go into a little more detail about. Not reporting our students' course selection in comparison to peers. I didn't go into this in a lot of depth just because it's our students don't necessarily even know that this happens and um, but it is part of the college admissions process a counselor has to certify the students course rigor so there's a question that says in comparison with your college prep students at your school this applicants course selection is and you have the choice of most demanding very demanding demanding average or below average as a counselor that's a very difficult judgment call to make one counselor might make a judgment call that a student with four APs is the most demanding, or a student with three APs is the most demanding, 
Or does a student who has all honors classes, should that be considered demanding or most demanding or very demanding? A student who has CP coursework, I certainly would not want to rate as below average. Um, so that's part of where we're making the recommendation to no longer answer that question so that the student's transcript can speak for itself, the level of their coursework can speak for, the, for itself, and we're not making a judgment call where it really is not necessary and to not cause harm that we certainly don't intend for our students by having to answer the question. So the other um, part of this proposal, or I guess um, it's not really a proposal because we're not changing it, but would just be to maintain the recognitions that currently exist. And um, if we potentially wanted to look at that um, later down the road, I would just want to be able to collect some more information about that. So understanding the change that we're making, I just wanted to give an example so that you can see what this actually looks like um, practically. So what we would be doing is calculating our students' weighted rank, which we already do after grade 11, and then calculating deciles based on the class size so that your students with a certain rank are in the first decile, second decile, third decile. So on the next slide. So this is an example of what a transcript looks like for a current Wilmington High School student. You can see in the top corner the GPA is reported a 3.25 on a 4.3 scale and then 91 in a class of 135. This is just an, an example so you see you know very concretely what this would look like. So if we were to change our scale the GPA would now be reported on a 4.0 scale and the rank would now say seventh decile or many schools use top 70 percent as a, a reporting of the rank so rather than a specific rank a student would have um, a rank rank that says the student is in the top 20 percent of their class or top 30 percent of their class and so forth this is just a review of the timeline so as i mentioned at the beginning we would be transitioning to a 4.0 scale with the incoming class of 2026. We need to do some work in Aspen to make sure that that populates appropriately, so that may take a little bit of time. Transitioning to the decile rank, because we're changing what, the way we report information that already exists, it should be a fairly quick change because we're not changing the way it's calculated, we're just changing the way we report it. So in that sense, we could potentially make that change for the class of 2023. So when they go to apply to colleges, they'll have a top 10%, top 20%, top 30%, rather than a specific rank in their, on their transcript for the fall. And the last slide is just a review of the two proposals uh, tonight. So the proposal to transition to a 4.0 scale, and then the proposal to transition to a decile class rank. Um, so obviously the in particular the the decile chain changing to a decile uh, format I, I see it as helping some students and maybe hurting some students so for example let's say I am 15th in my class um, I'd I'd want schools to know I'm 15th versus I'm in the second decile. I don't know. I just, perception wise, I, I don't know, you know, what colleges and university, how that, how that sort of gets perceived. So my question is, of the 38% of schools who do hold some importance on rank based on that, um, where we can find that data, um, what kind of schools are we talking about? Are we talking about Ivy League schools versus, um, you know, other schools? Does that make sense? Like, what <laughs> schools really do still hold importance on that? So the data is not that specific, okay. unfortunately. Um, having worked at an Ivy League school, I can say there is still, I would say they would probably be part of the category that says it's either considerably or, or moderately important. Um, I can only speak for the, well, 
really can't publicly speak for the one that I worked for, but that's the only one I have specific knowledge of. Um, but I don't, we don't have that um, more specific than what the information is from the College Admission Counseling Association. And in terms of when you were looking at our sort of neighboring districts or like our peer districts um, and sort of determining which ones you compare us to um, and, and sort of saying like the ones that are most like us, what, what are those factors? Like how do you decide like compare us to like Burlington because like what are those factors? Yeah, so we looked at the same list of schools that department had looked at in the, okay. the program review, so mm -hmm. there was a list of, I don't remember how many, 20, 30 mm -hmm. something, um, and then we looked more in depth at some of our league schools, our, our league counterparts, so other schools in the Middlesex League. You know I have questions, but I'm going to wait, <laughs> Mr. Samal. So I'm I'm curious. So I, I I like a lot of these proposed changes. I, I'm curious um, when we're thinking about the um, reduction, you know, minimizing anxiety um, and stress, um, and you know, however, like in the different scenarios that you presented, you know, one of them is to keep this top five. Uh, for grades 9 to 11. Um, I'm, I'm curious why we think or why you think that it takes such an, that would be an important thing to keep there. If we want to consider reducing stress and anxiety because I, I think that those top five especially when it's not even like a weighted thing, so it has nothing to do with, with course rigor, but even if it did, I think there, you know, when you've got this top five, there's a very little difference between uh, many students. You get, you get students who get straight A's, but are not in, you know, not in that top five. And so I'm wondering, well, what is the purpose of having the top five? What are we saying when we're honoring these students. And I don't want to take anything away from those students that are that are in that top five, but I don't know, like, to what end is it? Like, what is, are we? If we are causing anxiety and stress on students by doing this, is it worth whatever benefit we get from recognizing those top five? So I, I have some questions about, you know, just about that. I don't I don't necessarily know if if it's worth it. In, in my opinion, I don't know what, if people agree. I do agree, but David? Uh, I think I'm feeling kind of the same way. I actually also had a question about why we even do the top five based on simple average rather than any kind of weighting, because it really just says that, all right, you could be taking less rigorous courses mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously get, you know, because of that, get a higher numerical average and then you know be in the top five over people who are taking more rigorous courses and we take care of that with the weighted gpa uh, for 12th graders i'm wondering why we don't consider that something to do in the for 9th or 11. Sure. so so i don't necessarily know when the top five began um i can say from my standpoint as a counselor potentially i could see a benefit where a student who's in all CP classes but is appropriately placed there and works hard and does well potentially should have the same eligibility for some kind of um, achievement recognition as a student who's in all honors classes. I don't know where the where it came from, but I could potentially see that being a, a sense of if you base it on a weight, are you cutting out a whole group of students who are working equally as hard or who are appropriately placed in their courses um, and have achieved well but are not eligible for recognition. Yeah, I mean, I think I would respond to that by just saying, but that's not really a top five then. Like if there's, if the goal is to recognize people who are excelling in their courses that where they belong, <coughs> it seems maybe there could be a way to do that, but that's, but, but a, Sure. A top five doesn't seem to be implying that's what 
uh, that's what it is. But I, I have to say I'm kind of along, um, along Jay's thinking that I'm not sure what we gain from having a top five in grades nine through 11. Like once you get to senior, you know, once you, once you get to 12th grades and you're applying to colleges, then all right, people are gonna be compared against each other. But uh, I, mean, I, I mean, does any college actually care whether you were top five in your freshman year when they already have your entire high school career to look at uh, when you're applying as a, as a senior? I, I mean, I'm not sure that it has any advantage there. And so I, I really am wondering, like other than like what bragging rights, like is- Motivation. Um, you know, and I would actually, I'm, I'm in complete agreement, and I would really actually like, I've been saying this for a couple of years, having attended that, even prior to having um, a child at the high school, I would go, gosh, this seems a little antiquated. I'm not really sure how I feel about this. You know, I think that, and now having, you know, a child who's in the high school, it's sort of like along what Jay was saying, that, that I mean, we can talk separately about that ceremony, but there are just so many students who are des in some way deserving, where they literally have all A's or all A pluses in one A, and they're not sometimes recognized at all. I mean, there were situations, I think, where some students were invited who may have like a, even a sibling who was, re and it's just, I feel like who are, is that motivating or is that actually gonna have someone who's at that high, high level say, well, I mean, I did the best I could, I got all A's, and I didn't actually get any award. I mean. I think that's really, really quite dangerous, especially for our high achievers, and then also for students who weren't weren't recognized or were recognized for that other award. It's sort of like a, well, okay, like I'm not, I'm not here because I'm. I just think it's, ah, it's really every time I sit there, I go, oh, okay, and I don't. It just worries me a little bit because I think if we are saying we're we're committed to their social emotional health. <clears throat> Are we doing that? Which brings me to my next actual question, which is about this decile and just how, what is the, really, what is the difference? Like, are we talking, is it minuscule, really? Like, between one, two, three? Yes. And so now someone has a very high GPA and they could be in the third or fourth. Is that correct? Or so, so two points, I think, to address some of your questions. So when we look at our student um, distribution, Right now, we have 25% of our senior class has a 4.0 or better, and our juniors is a 31%, and sophomores 44% of the class. Um, so when you're looking at having all A's, there's a lot of students who have all A's. So when we look at potentially a class rank, they are close. That range um, tends to be it tends to clear as they get older. It, it tends to spread a little bit more um, but we do have students who I, that's that's part of the challenge of class rank is that you're giving the context to the college of where the student falls within their peer group so there is when you have a lot of students who have all A's there is going to be that spread where a student may not be as highly ranked even though they do have very good grades um, so that's I think that that's, I think, a challenge of class rank that exists beyond, you know, whether we report it in one way or another. That same question would occur if, a, if we didn't report it by a decile, you would be looking at a student whose rank is 50 out of a class, even though their grades are very good, versus having a reported decile where you're, you're not giving that granularity to the college. They can only consider what we give them. So if you have a, a group of students that we can say are in the top 20%, that potentially benefits them more than saying the student is ranked 30th. Yeah. Does it does it ever reflect poorly on a district if we like the less and less and less we report, we sort of become more and more ambiguous or granular, as you said. Um, does in the eyes of of a receiving school, does that reflect poorly on us in any way? So I would say, I would say potentially 20 years ago, yes. Okay. The way that the landscape has changed now, I would say no. Um, and, and many more schools are moving in a position. There's, there's a movement now for high schools that don't give grades at all, and they give paragraphs of, of progress, and they have students who go to all levels of colleges, even to the Ivy League with a grade report like that. So I think at the college level, 
you're, you can only, like I said, you can only consider the information you get from a high school. So if your high school doesn't rank, the college can't consider that. And they can't hold it against an applicant because the applicant isn't the one who has control over that, right? So in that way, I would say I have not heard, I have not ever seen it be a detriment to a student to sort of remove some of the more specific points that we've been talking about. On the flip side, it is frequently a detriment if the student if the student has a very high rank or if we give some very specific information, like, like I'm talking about the, um, when we're talking about ranking a student's curriculum. If I, as a counselor, have to say, well, I can't say everybody's most demanding. So if I, have a count, as a counselor, have to say that a particular student or group of students has <coughs> average or below average course rigor, I am probably putting them at a disadvantage. Um, so I don't think that there's a, uh, from my perspective, from what, I, what we've done, the research that we've done, the information we have from colleges, I would say there is not a risk of putting our students at a disadvantage by making a change like this. It, it, should, it should help them. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know that um, state schools will, will recalculate GPA. Yep. Um, when the students apply to them, so that they have a, so they take into it when they recalculate that, and you might not know the answer to this question. When they recalculate that, are they, they are they sort of doing their own sort of weighted system? I mean, it might be, I'm not exactly sure what they do, but is it that's what it is? It's a different. They're sort of doing their own weighted system based on what they see as the courses that the student took. Is that is that correct? So. Yes and no. Um, so I can give you some information about that. So every year we have colleges visit the high school. We as a department decide what questions we want to ask them. So we do a survey every year. We've actually asked the question about GPA in two years. We asked in 2018 and in 2020. And what we found is many, many, so I think we ended up with 86% of the colleges that we surveyed recalculate GPA. We asked a secondary question, if you recalculate, do you give additional weight for an honors or an AP course? The majority of them say yes, but some of them don't. So it really is dependent from college to college. I would say in general, they are giving, they're recalculating based on whatever scale they're using internally, tends to be something based on some kind of 4.0 scale. And then many of them are giving additional weight for an honors or an AP class, but I certainly can't say all. I could even give you the list of schools that said that they do or they don't, because uh, we do have that information. So, so it's a, a high percentage of students of students of colleges will recalculate. Yes, very high. Yeah, m almost ninety percent. Okay. So that that makes me just think about you know if if what you're saying is that if if we provide too much information, if we get too specific about a student, that actually could work against students. But the less information <laughs> we provide. Guys, it, it's not nothing's going to be held against the student, so it could potentially be more beneficial, and that's sort of the thought of behind doing a lot of this. Yeah. So what we're one of the priorities would be to eliminate places where, as a high school, we're making a judgment about a student. So if there's a, a space in an application or a form that a counselor is filling out, or part of the information that I have to provide on behalf of the student for the high school. We're looking for those places where we can avoid giving a college a preconceived notion about an applicant, giving them information that may make them make a judgment about that student that doesn't need to exist, right? So if we can give them the information they need, like a student's transcript speaks for itself. I, I would not, you know, I wouldn't change anything about um, the grade reporting and things like that. So if, if I can give the college the information that they're looking for, but I can make them have the responsibility of making a judgment about my student, I would rather do that than have a counselor make that judgment and be sending it to that college that they then use to make their decision. That that makes sense. Sense. Yeah, no, that does, that does make sense. Okay. Uh, so I, I want to just kind of go back to slightly big level and look at the sort of the basic elements of the proposals here. The, so the first one is the GPA. I, I don't see any downside to doing that. To me, that's an, that's an easy to me. We should do that. Um, I think on the, the decile issue, I, I think I'm persuaded that this is a good trade-off. I mean, all decisions like this are trade-offs, but I think that this, um, 
that main, maintaining some form of rank has some kind of has some downsides, but uh, especially when we're talking about that this only gets calculated at the 12th grade level. I mean, it's a competitive environment. Like there's, you can't remove all aspects of comparison and competition. And I think that kind of changing from like that strict rank, like you are here and everyone else is in front and everyone else is behind um, is a reasonable move in the direction of trying to, trying to reduce that, um, that a little bit. Um, I think we should eliminate the top five in grades nine through 11. Um, I see mostly downside there and, and not a lot of upside. Um, in grade 12, I think I would, um, rec I, I would maintain it in grade 12 though. Again, you know, once you actually get to the point where uh, you're you know, gonna go into the job market or you're going to college and you're, it's a you know, competitive environment, I think it's reasonable to still have a valedictory and a salutatory and so forth in the top 10. And I mean, on one level, I think that that also gives people something to shoot like shoot for. I mean, you know, people know they're going to be compared in some way that they, they want to excel, and you know, at least there's something to shoot for if you know that like this is how you sort of get to be the valedictorian. That take challenging courses that'll give you a high weight and then do really well in them. And if there if there are if there isn't something like that to shoot for, then there's sort of a sense of what do you channel that energy into. Um, you know, what, what, are you, what are you trying to do then to make yourself, you know, stand out in that process? And that's, again, it's all balanced. We don't want things to be so competitive that you get kind of an unhealthy, uh, an unhealthy culture. There were rumors when I was in law school that, uh, that people would misshelve books so other students couldn't find them um, because <laughs> they were so, <laughs> because it was such a, such a competitive environment, which seemed utterly horrifying to me. But, um, <laughs> But, uh, but I think that some of these, some of these aspects, especially in the, in the senior year, are reasonable. And um, the, the ranking earlier in that, I don't think we get a lot of benefit from. I think I hit everything in here. I but. think you did, yeah. I agree. Um, I think <laughs> that the proposals as they stand, I agree with the top five removal, nine to 11. I don't know if that's, if you need to go back to your team and discuss that and then come back to us. Yeah, so that's, it really wasn't something that we, explored in depth just because we didn't feel like we had enough information from our student body or our community to really make a recommendation about that and how it impacts our students. Certainly something I, we could go back and gather some more information about um, before I would come back with a, a proposal for that. I just would like to have more information um, on that point. And I'm just curious, others, how are you, I know that the three of us are feeling that we'd like to have that removed, but anybody else feel differently? No, I mean, I think that removal of that makes sense. And if if there want if you wanted to explore other ways of recognition for 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 those grades, sort of perhaps looking. Well, it's tricky though because you can't just recognize you know top five you know students who are in CP courses because kids can kind of be all over the map, right? I can be in honors history and CPELA, English. So that gets tricky. I don't know how else you could reconfigure recognition. So maybe the simple solution is to, to sort of rid that. Um, I, I potentially would have a greater question, and, and maybe this is not the tangentially related, but um, would you also would we then have to consider how we recognize students? Like every department has awards, every, like some of the other things that happen to recognize students. Um, I would just wanna be thoughtful about those as well if we revisit that. So I, I guess I would say if it would be okay with everybody here to go back and gather some more information and, and revisit that particular part of this, um, if that's a sort of point for the committee to consider. Um, and that seems appropriate, and I don't think that actually impacts either of these proposals, because the deci. I mean, that, right. that's sort of something separate. But because it's there, right? Yeah. So that, I it brought our attention it, so you to got it, right? The whole sort of context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, Glenn. I know you want to talk about the policy. Go ahead. Well, no, I, I just wanted to, for, and forgive me, and apologies for not sort of framing this as, as um, for some clarity at the outset. So this is here for a couple of reasons. These proposals, rather, there's really obviously a few items here as it relates to the GPA and um, the decile rank. Um, clearly, both of those would be uh, a part of a handbook, and that handbook is something that as a school committee you approve. You approve the program of studies and you approve the handbook. The program of studies has been approved, as you know. 
handbook will soon to be. And so the interest in coming back to this was to not try and just sort of slip this into a handbook that comes before you, but to have this kind of really great discussion, I think an important one around wrestling with these important ideas. Um, arguably, the, uh, the awards piece is not, to my knowledge, something that sits in any policy that you have. It might be, I might suggest this is more of a sense of the committee, but clearly a larger sense, right? These are the kind of things that can be discussed amongst just a few here, but can really uh, reverberate widely in communities when you talk about honor roll and all of those kind of things. So I know that this was sort of nested in these uh, recommendations, but just something to think about, and I think you're conveying a sense at least not of the whole committee, but certainly some of you. You do have a policy re finally related to this um, policy IKC, rank and class. So there's a nexus here depending on, on, on where you go with that. Um, collectively, we're presenting this again to you seeking you know, your, your buy-in to this. Um, I don't believe it's necessary at all for you to approve these tonight, but if there is a clear sense and a direction around their comfort with this committee, then it would be my suggestion that this can just come back to you as part of the handbook, mm -hmm. which will be when again, Ms. Peters? Uh, typically, I'm sorry, I forgot, but. Late April, early okay. May. Okay, um, so, so unless there's more discussion that is, is, is felt to be necessary. If not, I think that they could advance and be a part of that. And the committee, it's, uh, sorry, the policy itself could be um, you know, dealt with through the policy subcommittee. Okay, all right, perfect. Um, and then I'd I mean, I'd love to come back to this decile thing after we try it and just, I don't want to sort of sure. set it aside. I think it is something for us to, cons if we were sitting here going, I don't know, maybe we should kind of get rid of it all together. I think that it's something we probably should revisit and next sure, year or I, year after. I absolutely think, yeah, over the next five, even 10 years, it, it may be something we don't do at all. Well, and just for, I mean, I'm looking at that policy. Was it last revised in 2006? So. Yeah, I don't want to be the last one standing. <laughs> <laughs> Wilmington, they won't get rid of this uh, rank and decile. They're just holding on. So sometimes we hold on to things because we haven't actually revised things, right? So I want to make sure we're, we're keeping with the times. So, so we appreciate um, your, your further explanation. I know this has been quite a project for you to, to help us all understand uh, where we're headed here. But I get well, to share the information I never get to share with I know. <laughs> oh, it is so exciting Great. for us. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. Of information. Great. Are we done? Are you going somewhere? No, what's, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> trying to run away. <laughs> He's out of here. <laughs> Snowstorm out there. It is. Uh, it's a, It's 9:15. How are we feeling about um, this school choice overview? Would we like to postpone that? What are our thoughts? We can. We don't have to make any. We're not voting on it tonight. This was informational only. Um, do we want to dive into this, or do we want to put it on our next agenda? To read. To any thoughts? always on the agenda this time of the year correct because there always has to be a vote every year by June 1st is that right okay I, I would say I have a I have a lot to I have a lot of thoughts about this and I don't know if other members of the committee do as well could be a, a more of a lengthy discussion so um, I would be I would be in it and if it's in if it's indeed June 1st um, I don't know if we necessarily need to make any have that discussion right now. Okay. That's are we do we are we okay with that? I'd like to make a motion to table this agenda item to the next meeting. To a later date. Is there a second? Oh uh, every, second yeah, every so they clearly all would like to table Good. this for now. So we will we will put this on our next agenda. I didn't actually expect that um with only one item in old business I actually <laughs> thought we would be done at nine o'clock. So I apologize. Um I thought we were getting better. I was bragging tonight about our timestamps, but <laughs> Clearly, I have failed. So anyway, we will table that. We'll put that on our next agenda. And um, so the next item then is subcommittee reports. Uh, we didn't actually vote on MJ's motion. Oh, sorry. Is there, who's second? I don't even know who's second. Thank you, oh, Mr. Good. Fennelly. All in favor of tabling? That's unanimous. Thank you. That's why you're here, David, <laughs> among other reasons. But, um, subcommittee reports. I'm going to wait till the next meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
I do. Um, I do I've been in so many meetings this week. I can't even remember what I said. It's a good thing it's spring break from BU because I think I've actually been in a school committee meeting every single day for more than two hours now that I think about it. And none of them were subcommittees, were they? Were they, Paul? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, correspondence, MJ? None this evening. Your school committee dates. Uh, we've got March 23rd. March 24th through the 26th is Beauty and the Beast. Get your tickets, apparently now, because they're selling out. Uh, March 29th, Virtual Author Community Night, hosted by the Shawsheen School. We want to go to school, the fight for disability rights. That's at 7 p.m. April 13th, we have a regular session meeting here. And April 30th is the annual town meeting in the, is it in the auditorium? Or is it at Shriners? Is it Shriners? Right? No, it's in the oh, it's in the auditorium. Oh, just kidding. It's in the auditorium. <laughs> Could have sworn they said Shriner yesterday, but okay. Uh, and then that's it. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. That's David and seconded by Mr. Samaha. All in favor? That's unanimous. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Okay.